Okay, well, it's uh, 12.30, so we're going to start. Thank you all so very much for being here today for a very special event co-hosted by the Center for Civil and Human Rights uh, and the New Institute for Asia and Asian Studies. The director of the Center for Civil and Human Rights is seated right there. At the uh, I'm Michelle Hawks, I'm the director of the New Institute for Asian and Asian Studies. I have the privilege of introducing our speaker, my former colleague, Dr. Dan Flesch, from SOAS, or the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London. Uh, now, Dr. Flesch, in his career, has been a scholar, has also worked in various non-governmental organizations, spent so much time in Washington that he's actually now an American citizen, so, uh, has worked in the areas of nuclear disarmament, uh, human rights, war crimes, and so on and so forth. Very significant and at times very sensitive areas of policy work and academic work. So sensitive indeed that when he tried to fly from Detroit to South Bend last <laughs> night, three planes broke down <laughs> before, and one had to make an emergency landing before he actually made it here. So, so powers have been conspiring against this event, but we stand up against that. And we are here, and Dr. Flesch is here, and we are delighted. Uh, he is going to talk to us about his work on the United Nations War Crimes Commission in 1943, 1948, uh, and especially about the archive from the commission that he has in his possession uh, and he will be referring uh, to his new book, Human Rights After Hitler, which you can buy outside right next to the panel. So um, he will speak for about 40, 45 minutes, and then there'll be opportunity for questions after that. So please welcome Dr. Dan Platt. Thank you very much, Michelle, for your warm introduction and to uh, the New Institute and the Center for Civil and Human Rights for having me here. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here, not least to see my old friend from Washington days, David Courtright, uh, who I haven't seen in too many decades, but it's great to catch up with. Um, I would encourage you, if you, uh, between your sandwiches, um, on your uh, devices, uh, phones and, and such like, just yourselves to uh, log into our project website, unwcc.org. There's a wealth of material here, and uh, uh, I'm an academic and I've got a book to sell, that's outside. Uh, many of you are students and you've got dissertations to write. And what I would just say by way of opening is that uh, in all my professional life, I have never come across a field with so much rich, new, and now easily accessible uh, archival material for writing dissertations on many of the aspects that we'll be talking about uh, today. And uh, a part of my presentation will uh, take you into using um, the material we've got and some material we may also be able to share with your, um, with your faculty. Um, I'll just start by way of introduction just to talk through this, um, this document on our website, uh, which is, um, uh, hasn't been seen uh, by anybody uh, for 70 years which we found uh, after a very long declassification process from the UN archives in New York. Uh, and it's uh, an indictment of Adolf Hitler for war crimes. Now, we're not supposed to have indicted Hitler, and war crimes aren't supposed to have started until uh, Nuremberg. But here we are. Uh, there's something called a United Nations War Crimes Commission. Um, and there's a date here, December 1944 which for those World War II buffs is just before the Battle of the Bulge. The Nazis are still going strong. Um, and there's Hitler and a bunch of his uh, henchmen uh, on, a, on this piece of paper, which pretty much looks like a traffic ticket for war crimes, um, you might say. It's a standard bureaucratic form. And the first time I saw one of these borrowed by, ran by random chance, um, it may be realized that there was some serious official process going on here. Uh, it's a secretariat, there's uh, document numbers, and this is uh, the 424th charge processed by the commission, 
by the Czechs against the Germans and the tenth charge brought by the Czechs against the Germans. Uh, handwritten. Um, and if you go down the document on our website and elsewhere, you'll see it requires the, uh, the Czechs to specify what the charges are and they're the usual horrors. Uh, but this charge is supported by some 400 pages of indictments. Uh, the Czechs have another one of about 400 pages. And this is one in the end of a very large number. So um, that, in a sense, is a taster for what this is all about. Starting at the, at the beginning, um, as one likes to do, what I will do is to provide a, uh, a narrative of uh, this organization, and of chi particularly Chinese and Indian, but also as we go along, uh, a little uh, Philippine uh, and Korean um, involvement. And obviously this also relates in the Far East to, to Japan. And as I draw to a close, the final part of my presentation I look rather more at sort of analytical um, implications. Um, but I will just start with one um, uh, analytical uh, reference, which I didn't at all anticipate in writing this book. Here we are a year on into the Trump administration. And the connection between uh, Secretary Tillerson's closure of war, the war crimes office in the State Department the rise of avowed Nazis in the United States and elsewhere um, was very redolent to me because one of the key actors in this process I'll discuss later, FDR's forgotten ambassador on war crimes, one Herbert Pell, a uh, landed gentleman from um, New England who had been a member of Congress in the 30s and an ambassador for Roosevelt. He writes explicitly in his letters in getting involved in this process that the objective should be to prevent the Nazis sitting around the parish pump after that, some 10 or 20 years after their defeat, regaling uh, the young boys with the joys of shooting Jews and the joys of the Nazi regime in the way that the Confederates reasserted themselves in the United States. And as an, a Yankee Democrat, a campaigner for African-American rights in the 1930s, he explicitly makes this connection between American experience with the Confederacy and what needs to be prevented with the Nazis. And if I had to say, well, is all this effort at war crimes futile? One of the answers I would make at the end, and I'll make it now, is yes, we face a Nazi revival in various forms, in various places, but mostly it's centered on Holocaust denial. It's not centered on Holocaust triumphalism. What a great job we did in exterminating all the Jews is not something that is allowed, it, even in that discourse emerges. And that in large part, I would argue, is because of this overall success of war crimes and human rights principles emerging from World War II, not just this commission, Nuremberg itself, and so on. So, um, as they say, back in the day, um, in the probably the darkest points of World War II, the Japanese have just attacked Pearl Harbor. Winston Churchill hightails it to Washington to work out with Roosevelt how to win, which is by no means certain. The Nazis are outside Moscow. Uh, the Japanese fleet is expected to turn up outside San Diego any day although it never did. Uh, this is the climate of the end of 1942, uh, 19, uh, sorry, 1941-42, comes to the White House, which is full of Christmas presents and chaos. They have a succession of conferences about which there are funny stories, but I won't tell them now. But the upshot is, as part of the military planning, they decide that they need to have a political declaration. They have, they've had the Atlantic Charter, which is well known, uh, back in August of 41, um, before America's in the war, which has some principles, they need to make this broader. Now, a notion of associated powers is bandied around. And in the end, 
they come up with the notion of calling it the United Nations, which Roosevelt has overnight with his, uh, when he's in bed with one of his girlfriends, is wheeled down to uh, a Churchill suite in the morning um, and uh, with his girlfriend, whose, whose memoirs have recently been discovered, Churchill comes out of the bathroom um, with nothing to hide, um, like a gleaming cherub, according to the accounts. Um, Roosevelt, in his, Roosevelt in his, in his uh, uh, wheelchair, goes, we should call it the United Nations. Churchill says, good, and the rest is history. Only it isn't. Because while the Atlantic Charter is remembered, this, what became a document of 26 countries on New Year's Day, 1942, is only barely found in the footnotes. Um, and there's a wonderful book uh, which you can get for nothing on the internet by Roosevelt's speechwriter, writer Robert Sherwood, uh, um, called Roosevelt and Hopkins, which has in it a facsimile of a document um, where Roosevelt takes a, a British list of who the Allies or the new United Nations Alliance will be. And it's, you know, the Anglo-Americans and the Soviet Union, and then all the British Commonwealth. And Roosevelt, in his own hand, takes China and moves China up to number four. Now, given the racial prejudice against China in this country at the time, this is quite a radical act. Uh, the uh, English ambassador writes home, awfully sorry, Winston, um, uh, a bit later on, we know that China isn't a proper country uh, in any meaningful way, but the Americans seem to want to pretend it is, so we haven't got any alternative but to agree. Uh, and the same with India, still Imperial India is put up there on the, in the list. And so India and China are now included, China particularly in some of the wartime summits, but India is included in all the wartime processes, even still Imperial India. So it's at Bretton Woods, for example. And so in all the multilateral efforts during the war, under United Nations tag, India and China feature. And so that is the, the starting point. And uh, just as indication of how prevalent this is, and if you do internet searches for the uh, newspapers of Illinois, uh, which you can find very easily on the web, you'll find that that's how it, things are being referred to. And this is, we can just, um, uh, come on. Now that in itself is a bit of a showstopper. <laughs> uh, not uh, alternative news, but actually newsreels from the early 1940s. <laughs> United Nations heroes arrive in New York to help launch a nationwide drive for the sale of war bonds. Up Broadway, men of England's RAF, men of America's Navy, men who have met their enemy. London, the capital of the free nations of the world, was transformed on United Nations Day. That's what I'll do for now. We've got more on the website. But this is Buckingham Palace. Some of you may have been. Huge crowds celebrating, oh, thank goodness the Americans are in, but also the principles of the Atlantic Charter. And this in general, this political aspect of the Second World War has largely been, um, largely been forgotten. Um, around that winter, with the Nazis bogged down outside Moscow, and report, more and more reports coming out of Europe about the horrors, the exile the refugee governments in London, uh, having made one or two statements themselves, call a meeting at, uh, in, in London at St. James's Palace, you may have been passed, and uh, it's a meeting about war crimes. You can find it in Hein online. Um, and they, led by the po doomed Polish leader, General Sikorsky, make a declaration uh, and they say explicitly that while we understand that what we're doing about war crimes is just a, a glimmer of hope to the oppressed and possibly a glimmer of fear to the people who are oppressing them, nevertheless, we have to set out our determination that at the end of the war, 
in order to restore civilization and to present mob rule, the perpetrators of these atrocities must face law. And in order to provide legitimacy for our legal actions, they say in this declaration, this must have international support. And so we will support each other, they say, in um, an international legal process. And General Sikorsky says, we're not making international law today. What we are doing is making our determination to make international law today. And you'll find this in, in the documents. And if you're lucky in the modern version, modern history is it makes it into a footnote, the St. James's Declaration. The Anglo-Americans and the Soviets turn up, although the British Foreign Ministry doesn't want the British Foreign Minister to go, to leg legitimate it, but won't. They sit on their hands and they won't support it. And they never support this declaration. But the Chinese do. Telegrams back and forth to, uh, to China. And within a couple of days, Wellington Koo, the representative in London, signs up for, uh, for China. Adding in, um, well, perhaps we could do something about the war crime of suppressing a population through the, through the dissemination of narcotics, which I'm sure went really well down really well in London. Um, uh, so here we have China, China in that position, uh, supporting the exiled governments from Europe at a time when the Anglo-Americans and the Soviet Union really uh, are ambivalent at best. There are a number of declarations made um, about war crimes, which I describe in this period, culminating in a strangely forgotten formal statement about the extermination of the Jews at the end of 1942. And for our purposes, the important thing is that after this is sent out by the European states, all the rest of the alliance, including China and India, uh, is endorsed and support uh, this formal and very detailed, I discuss it in the book, uh, description of the extermination of the Jews of Europe are supported by China uh, and India uh, in this, at the end of 1942. With the pressure from these countries, Roosevelt and Churchill make a brief statement late in the year saying we should have a commission to investigate war crimes. And then kind of nothing happens for a year. Then we get to the end of 43. The war is dragged on and is turning in the Allies, United Nations favor. Stalingrad has happened. Um, the Western Allies are in Europe. The tide has turned in the Pacific. And finally, at the end of 1943, there's a meeting at the Foreign Office of some 16 countries, again, including China and India, um, to set up this War Crimes Commission. And at that first meeting, Wellington Koo says, oh, and we're going to need to have a subcommission to deal with Japanese war crimes as well at this point. The, the, the ambivalence, to say the least, of the Anglo-Americans uh, is prevalent throughout this period, and the driving force in Europe are the exiled governments. Um, as soon as they open up shop for business, finally, and start issuing these forms, or indeed designing these forms, and you have these discussions in the minutes, on our, which you find on our website, um, the Indians and the Chinese are sitting there, along with the Anglo-Americans and exiled governments. So a bit of a sort of sideways leap into international relations, uh, theories and approaches. Here we have states from the periphery of power in the heart of central power with an equal voice on issues of highly sensitive international criminal law resulting re reference in the conflict, which is kind of also not what we're taught. Um, and amongst the first charges, and I detail these in one of the chapters, are indictments brought by Poland uh, about the death camps going on. So again, we are always told no one really knew anything, nothing was done, nothing happened until Nuremberg. What we see here are very detailed indictments from the Poles and the French about the Holocaust. And as you can imagine, there's a whole talk I give on that. <laughs> but that's not what I'm here to do. For our purposes, uh, the reality is that the 
decisions to endorse the Polish indictments of the Nazis by Treblinka, Auschwitz, Drancy, and the rest of the horror show, sitting on that committee are the Chinese and the Indians. Being briefed on this, participating in this, supporting this. So there is uh, Asian agency in the international relations jargon on some of the most controversial issues of the time. They're also involved in the discussions then about structures. They, they, this commission develops um, what later became uh, joint military tribunals. That is, the, there were a lot of minor war crimes uh, trials later. And all in all, I should say that this commission dealt with 36,000 indictments in a five-year period, which resulted, as far as we know, in at least 2,000 uh, national trials and at least 10,000 convictions going through this process of um, traffic ticket <laughs> um, presented um, charges, plus those in China. They develop a proposal for what became the joint military tribunals working under MacArthur and Eisenhower. And who writes the first draft of this document? A Mr. Dutt from the Indian High Commission. Quite, he went on to have quite a prominent career, uh, even more prominent career in India, which we found. Uh, in discussion, I think, with other people, but there we are. There's a draft with Mr. Dutt's name on it, and it's the first document. They also, with strong uh, Chinese interest, develop a constitution for an international criminal court. Um, and of course, uh, well, not of course, but the Foreign Office and the State Department really don't like this. They don't want to have this happening. Um, and so although the commission, the commissioners in London from the governments support it, uh, it's blocked um, by foreign ministries. In addition to these innovative ideas on structure, they um, also um, develop advisory lists of what should be a war crime, based upon a forgotten list from Versailles, which the Japanese had accepted and which the German uh, had uh, helped initiate and the Germans had accepted. And this includes, the, as war crimes, rape and forced prostitution. And from then on, not in large numbers, but we have some 150 um, rape trials from this period, which Justice Goldstone had no idea um, existed um, in a discussion we had a couple of years ago. In particular, for our purposes, two of the key discussions that weren't resolved in, by the Commission were crimes against humanity and um, the crime of aggressive war. And I have a word or two the Commission didn't resolve this, but the French and the British who went into the Nuremberg discussions with Justice Jackson were deeply informed by these debates, and as were the people who, uh, who advised Jackson, and indeed the Soviet Union um, was aware of these discussions as well. And what we, from an Asian perspective, the only thing we usually hear about is the Indian Judge Pal in Tokyo and his dissenting judgment. No? Well, fair enough. Uh, that, that's a whole argument. But there's another side to this. The Chinese nationalist position was a very different one. They wanted to use international law to draw a line against imperial aggression. And so you can see very clearly the motivation from nationalist China in pushing for a crime of aggression to, as it were, call a halt <laughs> to what they had experienced and that motivation. And you see this very clearly in the minutes and the debates, the Chinese are pushing this. And so again, you know, as historians, analysts, do, should we take the value of one judge in one tribunal or should we take the consistent position of one nation um, on, this, on this topic? Crimes against humanity, we are, my dear friend, um, Philippe Sands has recently done this very fun book um, about Lemkin and Lauterpracht. Um, and pretty much what we understand is that crimes of, against humanity was a Lauterpracht idea uh, with a few other people involved. Um, 
and in the end was decided in a garden in Cambridge in discussion between Lauterpracht and Justice Jackson. So the, the great man theory of history, if you like. Well, there are other great man, men and people, but um, here is uh, exhibit uh, two um, from our top of our website. And you'll note um, uh, this, the four, 16th of March, 1944. So three months before D-Day. Nazis are still firmly running Europe. Pell, who I, did I mention Mr. Pell before? Thank you. Um, Mr. Pell is here in London, having, only just having been allowed to get there for, by the State Department, who held him up for six months, um, proposing a definition. Now, he's a smart chap, but this definition, as far as I can see, was actually drafted by a Harvard, Harvard professor, Sheldon Gluck, who should have a building named after him at Harvard, but doesn't, and Pell should have a street named after him outside the State Department, but doesn't. Uh, This, in a nutshell, is the definition which one uses the, today. Um, the, commission, the commissioners and most of the states endorsed this. Washington and London wouldn't have it. Uh, they wouldn't have the ICCC and they wouldn't have this. And to digress a little from the Asian focus, there is a classically modern interagency battle. Uh, going on while the war's being fought. And what we know of that is Truman decides to send Justice Jackson to London after the horrors are unveiled and we get the Nuremberg Charter. That's kind of what we know. What you don't get is the backstory of all of this. And frankly, without this work, I think it's analytically very difficult to find any agency in Washington that would have propelled these issues forward at that time. Pell, uh, father of uh, uh, Senator Claiborne Pell of the Pell Grants, some people may know of, but this is Herbert Pell, his father, uh, goes back to uh, DC on a visit at the end of 1944. And at this point, the British and the Americans sack their ambassadors to this commission for these reasons. There is a huge stink in the New York Times. Um, the British ambassador, uh, Cecil Hurst from the International Court of Justice um, resigns on grounds of ill health, although later goes on to be president of the ICJ into the 1960s. Uh, he, I think, briefed the Times. Pell, um, in murky circumstances with respect to FDR, but Pell is sacked by the State Department by the a uh, wonderful device of pulling the congressional appropriation for his salary. Now this is a fiction because at the time, New Deal leaders very often worked for nothing or a dollar. Captains of industry went to work for the New Deal or the war for nothing, but they won't have him and they won't have him going back. Um, he, in the meantime, has briefed Morgenthau, the treasury secretary, who gets all fired up about these issues. And this really, Morgenthau gets fired up because he's been in London in the summer and has been briefed by Pell on all of this. But it, Roosevelt and Morgenthau run into a roadblock in various respects, the anti-Semites and pro-German sentiment in the State Department, um, and also the view of um, Henry Stimson. And forgive me, uh, one gives a lot of talks and one can be repetitive if I've said this before, <clears throat> but Stimson writes a memo which is sometimes referred to on these issues, and he strongly supports the crime of aggression because he's in, been involved in the kellogg Brion Pract. But on this, he says, we can't have this because we might be held accountable for the lynchings of the blacks in the South. Now, Pell's view is stop the lynchings, African-American rights. <laughs> but Pell's been sacked, <coughs> although he goes very public with it. And as a result of that row, and I published it in the, in the book, there is a, a classically modern interrogation by a reporter of the Secretary of State on whether or not um, Roosevelt's policy of prosecuting the Germans for what they've done to Germans, AKA the Jews, is the State Department policy. Is the President's policy State Department policy? And there's like an eight uh, level exchange, uh, which I've reprinted on this. Um, and at the end of it, Acting Secretary of State Drew says, 
is it absolutely necessary that I be so specific? And the reporter says, is it absolutely necessary that you obfuscate? Oops, have I gone too far? And the State Department that then confirms the president policy um, in the spring of 1945. And it's this that I think opens the door. Roosevelt then dies, Truman comes in, and then you've got the background and Pell continues his, his fight. Now that takes us a little away from Asian agency. Um, coming back to the role of the uh, Indians and the, um, and the Chinese in particular, I've described how they're involved in all the discussions in London on these issues and on the uh, proving or disproving in the indictments that come forward. But the Chinese um, are able to initiate a war crimes commission in the Far East. Now, Barak Kushner has written a very interesting book about some of this, but he really focuses on three cases rather late on and on the rather dire performance of the dying nationalist government with respect to the Tokyo trials and doesn't really look at the process in place um, or indeed the earlier period, <clears throat> which I found to be quite instructive. And just as a indicator of what you find on our website and, uh, um, and so forth, this is the inaugural, the minutes of the inaugural meeting of the, well, there we are, Far Eastern and Pacific Subcommission of the UN War Crimes Commission. Uh, 305 Chung San Road, Chung King. I don't know if anyone's ever been there. Um, and then you see the, um, the list of attendees from countries. So this is not a sort of ad hoc um, uh, kangaroo court process. Uh, somehow the Poles and the and even Luxembourg managed to get to send their rep uh, representatives to this body in Chongqing, um, which despite the huge problems of doing anything in China at this period, from what little I know, um, starts to function and uh, by its closure in 1947 has processed some 3,000 war crimes charges, the documents for which have yet to be, in the, be found. Um, there may be somewhere in the US archives, there may be in uh, Taiwan, that Beijing may have them, where anyone wants to go look, go find, go fetch. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, but the discussions go on in the, these minutes of, of the summaries of the cases they're looking at for, uh, uh, for some years, um, well, through three years essentially until 1847, and process on 3,000 charges against the Japanese, the um, there is what is still the world's only multinational conference on war crimes trials takes place in London shortly after VE Day. And there's a, this is also the minutes are on our website, but the, the Chinese make a, a statement um, about these processes, talk about the number of charges um, and say, well, okay, there are probably 70,000 cases coming through but the people we're charging are probably mostly responsible for all of it anyway. Uh, this is not top leadership, but this is quite senior military leadership um, being involved in these cases. After the war, the commission continues its work. Um, the exiled governments uh, go back and uh, continue getting information from the populations. Before, during the war, they've been getting the information from refugees and smuggled out by the resistance. But then you can find that, for example, the Dutch describe how they will go back and send out war crimes investigators across the country. Most countries come to this meeting in London describing how they will systematically gather evidence. And thousands of uh, charges and trials come through uh, alongside the uh, Nuremberg trial. And I don't want to downplay its significance, but what I, if you had to summarize it, I would say Nuremberg is presented as uh, the jewel, the beacon, a lone uh, uh, a source of light on these issues. And rather, I would say what it should be regarded as a jewel in the crown of a much wider and richer um, 
range of uh, work at the time on war crimes. But particularly because of the need, immediate need to rebuild Germany, the growing conflict with the Soviet Union, and I have to say a, continu a continuity, which other people have written about, of American pro-German sentiment in the form of the Dulles brothers and others in the US government, there is a, a drumbeat to stop uh, the trials as soon as possible, to stop further indictments. And I have a, a chapter in the book called Liberating the Nazis, so that even those Nazis who were convicted in these processes were all out of jail before uh, in the late 1950s. Um, there were no longer any war criminals in any Allied prison uh, by uh, 1958, uh, at the time that uh, West Germany joins NATO. And in, con in concert with that, there's an effort to shut down the commission. The State Department and the British Foreign Office are pushing this as early as 1946, but the Nuremberg trials are going on. There's a momentum, and it takes a while. But by 1948, the commission's doors are shut, and shortly afterwards, uh, one of the operatives of the Dulles Brothers is a legal officer at the UN and has the files closed, such that even member states can't read their own documents. And there they remain until uh, the episode in the late 1970s of one Kurt Waldheim, an Austrian uh, general, Secretary General of the UN, who is found to be a Nazi war criminal, uh, and the Commission's work briefly surfaces. And there's a smidgen of opening of the archive, a crack which some years later I and colleagues took a chisel to, uh, which enabled us to get uh, access to this material. So let me um, turn more to uh, implications and assessments. With respect to Asia and East Asia, Asia, one of the things one gets from this, which is there is a common argument, formal and informal, from Japan about Japanese crimes with respect to Korea and elsewhere, of being, well, it wasn't really a crime at the time. In legal terms, null and crimen. Well, this throws that into a cocked hat. Um, because the Japanese are being prosecuted, not just by the Chinese, but there are a great many um, Australian, uh, Western Allied prosecutions taking place all across the Pacific. And from an investigative perspective, many of these are relatively simple because the Japanese, as it were, didn't retreat from their homeland. They all stayed put in the islands they were on and in the locations they were on until the end. So they were kind of, as it were, caught in, in situ, if not red-handed. There was no you know, trip to Argentina <laughs> for, for the Japanese uh, uh, out, in the, in the, uh, out, in the, out in the Pacific. And so you find trials taking place in Guam, in Rahul, in Singapore. There have been a number of very good recent Australian studies by Norel Morris and others dealing with some of these trials, but without the UN war crimes context. Uh, there is, I think, an issue, a technical issue with respect to Korea, because technically Korea was part of the Japanese empire and the non-intervention crimes against humanity principle applying to not try states for what they're doing in their own territory or might use to defend the Japanese position. But in general, these crimes, particularly including a rape and forced prostitution, are demonstrable war crimes in this era. In this era that they are formally approved by, they have been approved at Versailles. Japan itself approved the Versailles list, which had these as crimes on it. And this list is then used as an advisory document for the use of member states by the commission uh, from 1943 on. And as I say, we've located at least 150 trials across Asia. Uh, and in particular, what we haven't looked at is the role of the Philippines. Uh, the Philippines moving towards independence in this era passes its own war crimes law. I'm not talking about trials in the Philippines conducted by the Americans, where rape also features as an issue, but the Philippines themselves um, conducted, uh, I'm not sure how many, 
Um, and I think the archives are in Manila, but I haven't accessed them. Another uh, trip for somebody. Um, but what I do know is that uh, something like 40% of the Philippine trials concern sexual violence conducted by the Philippines against the Japanese at this period. Now, of course, this, um, and I'm straying the territory, which is more familiar to, uh, uh, <coughs> to Michelle and others here, and I'm I happy to, to happily be corrected, but this set of issues, I think is quite important in the discussions about East Asian politics today, and Northeast Asian politics today, uh, because clearly the experience and vary, varying interpretations of that war by the different states involved um, loom large. And for a number of states, World War II crimes are very important to that. So this information, which I beg other people also to, to analyze, also, as I say, informs that debate. But it is also perhaps not problematic for the Koreans, so I think can use it quite usefully perhaps, but it's a little problematic for Beijing perhaps. Um, they can release their own archives and perhaps will, but there's an ambivalence I think about the, how far the work of the nationalist government can be credited these days or not. Um, I'd written in an earlier book a little about the um, uh, Chiang Kai-shek meeting with Churchill and Roosevelt, the Cairo Declaration, which dealt with who gets which islands. Um, and Beijing happily flew me to a conference um, <laughs> Uh, a couple of years ago um, to, to talk about this. And what I said there is, I guess, what I'll reprise now, which is if you're going back into this era and talking about the islands there and the authority of wartime statements, don't pick and choose. The reason Chiang Kai, one of the reasons that Chiang Kai shek was in his meeting was because China had supported these declarations, including the one. I mentioned Christmas 42, the declaration by United Nations, which by the way, has a statement committing to the support for human rights in our own lands and in other lands, which is probably the first multilateral statement in support of global human rights ever made. And the Chinese then became involved in a range of other human rights activities during the war. So there's perhaps a dilemma in picking up this issue with respect to Japan, when China, the current uh, Chinese government may be slightly more reluctant to pick up some of the other issues. And the recent discussions about uh, censorship obviously, um, obviously speak to that. More broadly, if we're looking at the role of the International Criminal Court in international justice today, the, there is, I think, a very powerful reinforcement to contemporary activity from this, this work and this material. Generically, we can look at the crimes currently going on in various parts of Africa, um, in Syria, in Yemen, and go, oh, it's all too difficult to do anything. Um, and where do we find the political will? And I think that becomes rather harder to sustain if one says, well, actually, the best lawyers in Europe and elsewhere gathered in air raid shelters in London when Nazi missiles were crashing into the city, as you find, you know, the final minutes of this whole uh, commission I think the French uh, André Gros goes to one of his colleagues, ah, oh, yes, I do remember when I first met you in an air raid shelter. And Herbert Pell describes how, well, we just discussed, just decided that um, bombing a city of itself was not a war crime when the whole building blew up. <laughs> so this is international criminal justice on the front line. These indictments of Treblinka, 
are based upon smuggled testimonies from the resistance. Now, at that point, there's a world war going on. Here we are, first worlders, rich Europe, rich America, uh, able to draw evidence and testimony in a systematic way, if we wish to, from um, Syria, Yemen, Congo, in an international system for future use. And to be frank, if you could think about doing that in 1942, I don't quite see what the excuse is to say it's too difficult in 2017 <laughs> with all the resources at our disposal. And this is a point that I think can be put to governments. Um, on the plus side, the US was doing this. Although the US War Crimes Office and the Judge Advocate General's uh, Department was created three years after Nationalist China created one, just to, <laughs> to point out. But the US has a, uh, a great record here, uh, not just on the negative side, on the positive side to be drawn on. But China and India, and the Indian ambassador at a briefing we had a couple of years ago at the UN, uh, Ambassador Mukherjee, actually claimed, uh, at least briefly, um, credit for India's foundational role. So one can go to states, well, you have a history of support for these issues at this time, at this foundational moment in your national mythology. <laughs> you were doing this. Yeah? Um, so therefore, if you're an advocate of these issues, you can take that and, as it were, remind or embarrass states to live up to their earlier forgotten standard. And the same, I think, applies in Europe. Um, but from our purposes, India and China, I think, are, uh, are obvious obvious places to start. And this also goes through to practice, and I'll uh, move towards a close here. At the moment, we have an uh, international justice system uh, in crisis. People may say, well, Secretary Tillerson is just keeping up with the trend. You know, war crimes trials are futile. The Russians, the Chinese, the South Africans have pulled out. It's just kind of some northern racist thing to beat up Africa. Anyway, the ICC is too big and too slow. Ah, let's give the whole thing up. Well, I would just say the record is if the pragmatists had had their day, we would never even have had Nuremberg. And without those processes, question mark, would things have been better or worse? Uh, but also this system of having nations coming together to make advisory peer review judgments on what in the legal jargon would be called a system of complementary justice is a system that I think speaks very much to the needs of the present moment. Because the ICC at its best will deal with top leadership. And this is a system which dealt with tens of thousands of perpetrators. Now, I might have mentioned earlier, were these just kangaroo courts? I have a chapter dealing with this and I've worked with Mark Ellis, who's uh, head of the International Bar Association. And broadly speaking, acquittal rates are roughly of a modern standard. Uh, the rates at which charges don't meet a prima facie standard, which is the key question for the commission when nations bring their charges. Um, is there a prima facie case? Uh, and indeed, from his examination of the, some of the US trials, they do make a, um, a there's a clear, uh, strong, um, fair trial standard being operated, which isn't to say that they all are, but neither are they today. But nevertheless, the US, which conducted some 600 military tribunal trials, these trials, all of which full, pay, full thousand word transcripts are on our website and on the ICC website now, available for your study and dissertations, have never been published by the JAG school in Virginia. Justice Jackson was there as a, a, a sorry, <laughs> um, um, a colleague was there um, and I couldn't get any interest from them, even a couple of um, years ago, Richard Goldstone, in publishing them. Its own official history of the JAG barely mentions these trials. Some of them are very important. For example, Ben Ferenz, who kindly wrote the foreword to my book, and the Einsatzgruppen trials are very well known. But there are a very large number of other US military tribunal cases. And one of the key reasons they're not 
is because that process was um, smeared uh, effectively by one of the pantheon of gurus of the current president, uh, Senator Joseph McCarthy. And this is where we come full circle, uh, going back to the issue of Pell's determination with respect to not having the Nazis uh, doing what the Confederates did. Um, McCarthy, with a German-American constituency, working closely with uh, immediately post-war German churches uh, and other political leaders campaigns vociferously that all these Germans were just honest Germans, they should all be let out, the war crimes trials should be stopped and infamously um, and I find this hard to credit, has a Senate hearing before his most infamous ones, a Senate hearing on a massacre by the Nazis of 100 GIs at Malmedy in Belgium during the Battle of the Bulge. And in the Senate investigation, he calls more witnesses than are called at Nuremberg. And what is McCarthy trying to prove? He's trying to prove that the US prosecutors have maltreated these Nazi SS men prior to their trial, right? And the political climate at the time lets him get away with it. In the end, the Senate discovers that all these SS troopers have been provided with ample tobacco at American taxpayers' expense, and that at best, McCarthy is uh, exaggerating, if not completely fabricating. But the damage is done. Um, and these uh, prosecutors uh, and their work have been smeared and disavowed to the present day. But yet, um, thanks to uh, our work and colleagues in the ICC, Hundreds of these transcripts now exist and should be brought into uh, common use. Not least uh, because they routinely prosecuted torture. Japanese and Germans are convicted of torture through stress positions and waterboarding and other fashionable techniques uh, of the current regime. So I think there's a real value in this material, both practically um, and in the broader political sense, not just the United States, but more broadly um, in Asia and in the global dialogue on um, transitional and retributive justice. So as a friend of mine said, if you have been, thanks for listening.